Welcome to Club Talk Hurling, brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. Uh, we're here with the classic jerseys on, a bit of uh, Dublin representation, a bit of Kerry representation. There was county finals there this weekend. But Michael Verney, where do we start only in Tipperary? You were down at Semple Stadium and you saw Kildang and beat Lockmore with the last puck of the game. It was unbelievable. It looked like John McGrath had won it, uh, knocking over a placed ball. Then up the other end, Joe Gallagher wins the puck out, pa uh, paws it out to Brian Malachny. And it's the sort of stuff that you grow up, you're in the park, and you're like, oh, we're point down with a few seconds to go, and just smashes it into the top corner. Like, it was the dream way to finish a game. Like, he's a hero forevermore, Killer Langan's first ever senior title. Oh, uh, without a doubt, uh, Brian Malachty is to be, as somebody said to me, I was interviewing him after the game, and they just hit him on the shoulder and said, get that man a statue. Like, he'd be canonized, it's a... Uh, in Kiladangan, like to win your first one after a bit of heartbreak in two previous finals, particularly last year, the way the way they did it was just, oh, I was incredible really. It was a brilliant game. Uh, normal time was absolutely exhilarating from start to finish. I think there was a small bit of a lull in extra time. Both teams just looked like they were, just looked like they were goose really. They were so tired. And uh, in fairness, it was, it was really, like it was, it was 13 seconds of madness. So from when John McGrath put that 65 over the bar, Barry Hogan already had a ball in his hand. Four seconds after the ball went over the bar, he had sent a booming puck out down the field. And I, I had to feel sorry for poor old John Matter because he was unbelievable at centre back. Absolutely unbelievable. And I'd say he made, if he made one, maybe two mistakes the whole day, one was a bad clearance and the other one was that it, it looked like Joe Gallagher. It was an uncontested catch down the middle of the pitch. And the whole thing just opened up like the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, Brian Malachny got the ball, was able to take a touch, look up, and without being tired, it was so ballsy as well to go for a goal. Because if, if it had been stopped, they were gone. If it had been put it over the bar, they had another shot at it and would have had penalties. But he went, went for a goal, absolute rasper. An interesting little subplot as well. Just about 10 seconds before the 65 went uh, out over the line, uh, Darry Egan had his number 16 jersey on, ready to go, ready to come in for the penalty shootout. Wow. When, when, yeah, when the 65 went over, the, when the ball went over the line for the 65, he took the jersey back off and presuming the game was done and obviously confident that John was going, John McGrath was going to put over from the middle of the field. John McGrath put it over and then all of a sudden, as I said, 13 seconds from the ball going over the bar, the Brian Malachny having the ball in the net at the far end. Unbelievable scenes. Uh, it's just like, anyone who doesn't get why club is unbelievable, this is it. Like, look at the amount of games in both codes over the weekend where it was nothing but drama. Like, even in the Throne football final, Dungannon winning that on penalties. And I mean, whatever about whether you want penalties to be the way it happens or not. You have so many close fought games. We all love inter-county, but a lot of the time there are pastings until you get to maybe the All-Ireland sort of final. We see that so often in football in the last couple of years with Dublin Mo and everyone down. But this is why club is so good. So much drama. Like I was watching the game back on TG Carr. I, I didn't see it live because I had my own match. But uh, you know they kept on focusing in on this uh, on this group of people and and this girl with blonde hair and she kept just going nuts the whole time and it was almost like we might as well just go back just to get a taster of how it feels every time by focus on her reactions like it was just brilliant and you were saying afterwards you had a chat with Brian Malachny and you were kind of trying to put a bit of context on it but of course he made you feel like a really old man. Yeah, no, it was funny because like when I see a finish like that and particularly for him like. It is it was real right or over stuff for me. Like it was, you know, forty four minutes he came off scoreless. To be honest with you, I'm I'm not sure if he felt the weight of it in that first. Well, isn't that minutes. the mad thing? Yeah, I meant to bring that up to you as well. Taken off after forty four minutes, like he could never have imagined that a half an hour later he would be the hero. Like and when, like his name all over people's lips all over the country. This is the funny thing, and I always try to say to particularly get into young lads around clubs and just say, like, it actually doesn't matter, like, what you did with the last ball. It actually doesn't matter how you played for the first 50 or 55 minutes, as long as you can have some sort of an impact. You just never know when the ball might fall to you. He came back on the 74th minute. Uh, Willie Connors went off. He looked absolutely he just wrecked coming off. And Brian Lockley's first touch was a point. Got another point then in the 81st minute, actually, to, to bring it level before John McGrath got to 65. And then he ends up with the winning goal. And I just tried to say to him about Ryder Rovers or whatever. And he kind of looked at me. He, he's only young, he's only a young fella, around 18 or 19. And he had no idea who, who Ryder, Ryder Rovers was. I was brought up on Ryder Rovers. But just some interesting little quotes that he had. He just said, that was unreal. Some buzz. 
Uh, I was disappointed with how he played. Um, this was when he had to come off, but I just had to stick with it when I got the chance to come back in. And we had to do what we had to do to win the game. We're just delighted to win it. It was just a bit of luck, really, that I got, that I got in the right position for the scores. The lads were unreal. We just had to stick with it and get over the line, and it was the perfect way to win the game. He couldn't ask for any more. Um, I asked him, was he, was, did, did the point ever enter his head when he got the ball? And in fairness to him, it, it never looked like it did. He said he took one little glance up. He just said, I gave one quick look up, and as a control, that I saw that it was very close to the goals. So I just said I'd have a pop, and luckily it went in. So happy days. Um, he just said, like it's unbelievable, a great time to be alive, and a great way to, be, or a, and a great day to be a killer angle man. Like to win their first county title in that manner, and like things, it, I just that's what you just have to love about hurling, how quickly things can change. Um, I just mentioned it in the intro to my piece today, in independent on the game, just like the Rocky Balboa quote, like the it ain't over. Till it's over, and like literally, it it wasn't over, and they, they got they. And fair as Barry Morgan, it was a bit of genius from him as well. Fair enough, he could have been pulled back, but he had the ball in his hand. He he took that chance, and uh, like Michael Kennedy, the referee probably never thought it was going to end up where it did end up, but it did. And Killa Dangan are absolutely smiling this morning, heartbroken for heartbroken for lot more. Like scoring three goals in the first half of the county final, you never envisage that you're going to end up losing the county final. But in fairness to Killa Dangan, there were a couple of things in the game. They had nine wides hit after after um, after what was it? Nine wides hit after about ten minutes of the game, um, and it, it it looked like there could be a bit of a squander mania, like there had been before. They conceded that third goal, but in fairness to them, after the concession of each of the goals. They responded with a point and most importantly when they were three three to seven down after the third goal alan flynn went back sweeper and this is why people should never knock you know the, the benefits of a sweeper system he went back sweeper just shored things up a bit and if anything they were actually better going forward when he was playing sweeper for that seven or eight minutes than without a sweeper they ended up two down a half time with him particularly influential and his twin brother paul brilliant up the other end with seven points but they, they had abandoned their short passing tactic. I don't know if it was pressure, the, bit, the buzz of a county final or what it was. But when Flynn went back into that sweeper role, they kind of got back into the groove again. And um, yeah, it was just a brilliant, brilliant game from start to finish. It really was. Like, the class of Noel McGrath, the class of John McGrath when he went in full forward, the class of Paul Flynn, John Matter absolutely outstanding as well. David Kendi showing his football skills in <laughs> 2001. 2001 when he won an All Ireland hurling title with Tipperary, but as Damien Lawler, uh, the RT journalist, was saying to me yesterday, he was a, a tip footballer before he was a tip hurler. He came out with this like flick up that you just you wouldn't even try in the training ground. It was just brilliant. It was a game that had absolutely everything, and probably the great, probably one of the best finishes to a game I've ever seen. Yeah, incredible. Like the way Kiladangan didn't panic after conceding those three early goals. That was the key to it because a lot of teams would have kind of. I don't know, just found it very hard to recover. I think the fact that they lost two finals in, in the recent kind of years, in a way like, you know the way Mayo used to capitulate in All-Ireland Finals in 2004 and 2006, but then there was a new steal to them, you know, in 2012 when they lost to Donegal, fair enough, but they didn't capitulate after conceding two early goals. And even against Dublin in some of the recent All-Ireland Finals and semi-finals, two, two own goals, crazy. And yet they still come back out, get themselves level, maybe even ahead in some of these games. So I is think that a lot? To, is that a lot to do with experience, Shane? Like exactly. if, if that had been Kieran Angan's first final, like don't know if they would have been able to react as coolly as they did, you know? Yeah, I think that that's it. That they're like, we've been here before. We know things are going to go wrong. We have that experience, but we also know we have the quality. So when they, like, I mean, I didn't watch the game live, and I knew the result, but you could just see that there wasn't panic happening. So. That's what I was really impressed with. And Paul Flynn's leadership up front. I mean, you mentioned John Maher there as well. I think there are two players that have put their hand up to Liam Sheedy who would obviously be there watching. Because like I've seen Paul Flynn and you've always seen that he has talent, he's great wrists. But then to actually step up when it when things are in the melting pot and things are going against your team, like that's that's sensational stuff. Seven points for play. So I'm sure he will get a couple of chances for from Liam Sheedy and, and he already has gotten one or two in the in the league, but yeah, like that that was the key for me, the fact that they didn't panic and lads continued to get on the ball and try to play the right way. And they absolutely deserve it. I mean, they're a club that has, I think around 2008, they were winning the intermediate in Tipperary, didn't have a team up senior level. And then they won intermediate a couple of years ago with their second team, if, if I had that correct, or else got to a final. I mean, what a turnaround. And like Brian Lawler, the manager, explained to you how the Kiladangan story should give hope to anyone. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Like there's a lot of clubs 
like maybe you know they're not going that great at senior level or things aren't going that well like this is like what Brian Aller says what they're after doing the last 25 years is really an inspiration to any club that anything can be achieved he just said this wasn't one or two years coming 25 years ago the club were in a bad place we actually self-nominated to go down from intermediate to junior A I was actually playing centre back we got hammered by Ross Gray's second team in my generation we have come back through to win a damn Breen that's absolutely phenomenal that's 25 years of work uh, from coaching players and committee level as well as getting the right structures for the club going the right way it's a lesson for any club that it can be done and it, and it surely is like if you have if you have your underage structures in particular really really they're really Really, really sound and you have a really really good base there you're, you're giving you yourself a chance but if you're just living on a wing and a prayer these things that happen and things can slip and players can just slip away from the scene very very quickly but and absolutely like everything about yesterday's final it was the perfect day it was the perfect game it was the perfect advertisement for everything that's glo- good about club hurling and good about the club in general and even just like as you said in those 13 seconds it went from like agony to like the greatest ecstasy they will ever have and it was a pitch invasion the second the, the goal went in it was absolutely unbelievable it was brilliant it was um it was just it was one of those days that just makes you realize what it's all about yeah and i mean obviously you had to have a, a word about lot more as well they were unbelievable and they've to go in, they've to turn around and go into a county football final against the machine like clonmel commercials next week that's going to be a tough turnaround but can i ask you what was the atmosphere like you know because such a small crowd allowed in there and on tv they obviously have the microphones near them but it sounded like it was a de- decent atmosphere even though we're talking about a fifty thousand capacity stadium with just a few hundred people the atmosphere was deadly to be honest with you. Yeah. I was chatting to, chat to Pat Flory after he was on duty with TJ Carr and I don't know he said it was such a big stadium maybe that there's an echo in it when people when people roar or whatever but you know there was boys up the back of the stand baiting the, you know, the, the galvanised at the back of the stand and get all that noise um, I thought I thought it was a brilliant atmosphere now I I tend to kind of lose the run of myself in the press box anyway and I, I kind of would think there's an atmosphere even if there was nobody there because just can you get into it yourself but the 200 that were in there made a fair noise now they did in fairness and uh, like if imagine there'd been six or seven thousand there like there normally would be but it was still an unbelievable atmosphere it was a savage atmosphere yeah it was yeah. brilliant um, and Turles was just it was perfect it was made up for an exhibition of hurling and that's exactly what it was both teams went about kind of playing I'd say in the, in the right manner it was kind of like it was like the score taken of a challenge game but like the intensity of a county final it was all meshed together it was brilliant yeah oh, and long may club games being on telly week after week continue it was just great stuff um, and obviously get your comments into us like who do you think played well what did you make of the day? All that sort of stuff. Get that into us. Uh, the Seamus O'Reen final was on as well. We might as well talk about that because this was on Saturday to see who goes back up to the Dan Breen level for next year. And Mulnahone beat Laura 4-18 to 2-19. 2-5 for a young lad called Owen Kelly. And uh, I tagged in Liam Sheedy and I says, you want to keep an eye out for this lad? <laughs> Very good, actually. I, I actually just got a message from the court there now because I was just looking to chat to him just about the celebrations and everything. And winning a senior B at, at, uh, at 38 and coming out of retirement and stuff like that. So he, it literally just popped up on my phone there now, so it's funny that we're talking about him. But like, while you can lose a yard of pace or a couple of yards of pace, you never lose your wrists. He's always had the most beautiful wrist probably nearly ever to play the game. Um, and just when that ball is in around him, there were so many like uh, trademark Owen Kelly scores the other day or trademark Owen Kelly touches. And to be honest, he was one of the main reasons why I thought Mullinahan were, were the lock of the week. Um, I know Laura are really good emerging side, and there were a couple of really good players, particularly the likes of Owen McIntyre. Brian Hogan's well able to fend for himself out the pitch. Obviously, they have the Bonner as well. Niall McIntyre, uh, who's a, a fellow sports journalist like ourselves, and Colin Fogarty in attack, who's a lovely forward, was in with the Tip Miners last year. They're the common side, and funnily enough, while Mullinahan won the day, I think Laura will actually be the stronger of the two going forward say in four or five years time just because of the age profile of their team but it's hard beat experience in a final like that like Paul Curran was was rolling back the years Sean Curran was brilliant Mark Kyo was outstanding too and as you said Owen Kelly just had those bits of genius when they were needed like the game was getting very very tight and I think Laura had it back to two I think it was two was it 215 to 116 and then it was like bang bang 
two goals within the space of about a minute and the game was over. One of them from Kelly. Uh, it was a pretty it was a brilliant game as well. The bits I saw of it were brilliant and I listened to bits on the radio as well. It was a serious game. Yeah, well this is it. Like if you have two well matched teams, it doesn't matter that it isn't senior A, like it's it's Seamus O'Rean Cup, just the, the tier below. It was still really exciting to watch. There's some nice scores. Kelly actually had he he had a tough enough first half, like he didn't win every ball going in, but he still had two from play and you're like but there's the thing like if you put it into his hand it's going over the bar and that textbook thing left side where he's leaning away and knocking it over the bar buries a beauty for his first goal high ball comes in from the second one fends his man off sh- uh, shapes one way it turns and buries it the other just glorious to watch and like i was throwing it out there about him being the goat and obviously some people are going to have a pop not everyone agrees that he is but the thing is it's not that i think longevity wise he's the greatest of all time because we all know that like he burned so bright for a set number of seasons and he had some ups and downs either side of it. Wasn't always unbelievable. But I think Owen Kelly playing at his peak for a couple of years, no other player has come to that level. And a lot of that is just the beauty of watching what he does. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. Like if you're looking at longevity over fifteen or twenty years, maybe not. If you're looking at when he was at the height at it, the best of his you know, the best of his form, he was absolutely unstoppable. I think I think of the let's say probably the O nine uh, All Ireland final, he was brilliant that day. He scored some serious points. He was on Jackie Tyrrell, I think, that day. He scored four from play that day. Uh I remember the, the touch against Limerick where he controlled a puck out. Like when he was on his game, he was unstoppable, and it might. It was probably it was probably a four or five year period there where he was nigh on unmarkable, and uh, that's kind of what you say. But and like, and plus as well, he, he, to me, he's the goat in terms of you know wrists and nearly hurling skills, and he's probably the best. Yeah, he's probably the most skillful hurler I've you know I've seen in my lifetime. I would say uh, definitely the most skillful forward I've seen anyway. And definitely get your comments in. Let us know who do you think was the GOAT and if you agree or disagree that, like, at the very peak, was Kelly the best hurler we've ever seen? As I'm sure other people will have other suggestions, so please let us know. Now, the Dublin final was on over the weekend. Uh, I was talking out with, with the B team, and we might touch on that uh, because we were also in a county final. But the A side, Kula 220, Ballyboden 118. And Ballyboden were 111 to 15 ahead in this game. Now, we were booted out of the stadium, and I didn't get back in and see the game. But uh, obviously, I, I've read up on it and I've spoken to a few of the boys. But Darrell O'Connell, Kerry man, he lifts the, the county title after all that. That's uh, five titles in six years, fairly good going, I think, by anyone's stretch. And, and of course, Bally Bowden had their period of dominance, I think it was something like six and seven or six and eight before. So, uh, yeah, cool as good run continues. A Kerry man. Imagine anyone thinking a Kerry man would lift the Dublin scene or Ireland title. Mm. Um, I wonder how much, how much has that happened across the country, actually. And again, get your comments in. Uh, players from a different county lifting a county title. Oh God, I, I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't say it's that that regular as a captain like to come mm. in to a club and end up being captain of the club because you you know within clubs you've seen it as well they're very uh, reticent to give that sort of almost power to an outsider so um, like that just shows how Dara has been accepted in as Jared Canning would say the jockey club. <laughs> um, that just shows you how much he's been accepted, even. And I know a lot of the cooler boys are kind of are, are fluent Gael Gores, and uh, that obviously is a fluent Gael Gore as well, and, and would fit in there very well. But like, they, did, did Kula, his speech in Irish actually? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Like in fairness, and Kula kind of Kula haven't been unbelievably impressive this year, but they've they've finished games unbelievably strong, and they finished like a train again yesterday. Um, I was just reading uh, my colleague in the Independent, Conor McKeown, his report and uh, just kind of saying like this is five and six years now for Kula the only the, the only pity is I suppose from their point of view and we'll probably touch on it is that there's no provincial or All-Ireland campaign um, because I know that, I know that they'd love a crack at Ballyhale they missed out on that crack last year but it, it is another year for that team you know without getting another chance to go for an All-Ireland which is probably disappointing from their view but in fairness like Willie Maher has come in two from two now two Dublin titles in a row um, and it's, it's what looks like a smooth enough transition from from Matty Kenny's reign into into his own reign, but um, yeah, Ferris Body Borden like Body Borden went out and went out in the shield again as as they do. Uh, I just didn't think they'd be able to win a relatively high scoring game, and Kula just had the that bit of turbo in the legs to finish it out. Obviously, Sean Moore and Sean Moore got a great goal, and David Tracy seemed to be 
playmaking for the whole day. He seems, seems to be setting up an awful lot as he as he regularly does. And uh, yeah, fair achievement. Five five titles in six years a massive achievement. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Dave Tracy goes with Dublin this winter because if he can stay right, he, he's looked very sharp this year. So yeah, we'll see how that gets on. Yeah, in the B final, of course, you had to bring it up, but St. Finbar's beat us two fourteen uh, to seventeen points. And of course, we got the victory against them out of the way in the first group game, and then they turned it around in this final. So congratulations to them. Uh, Trollier, Eamon Dillon, he scored, I think, 1-1 from play. He was quite good. And yeah, to be fair, they deserved it. But sure, what can you do? A sickener of a day for me. Shane, just on that, um, fair play to you. I know you're probably nursing a small bit of a hangover today, so fair play to you for, for, even, for even being here. The easy thing to do would, would be to not be here. But uh, I know you, you know you pulled the hamstring the week before the match, and I've been in a, a similar position. Uh, talk to me about your mental frame even coming into the week. It's Termite is the only way I could describe it when you're carrying and not going into a game. You don't know whether you're playing or you're not playing. You don't know whether you're able to play or whether you're not able to play. Just talk me through maybe what the, the seven days leading up to the match were like. Yeah, I, and I think a lot of players have gone through this. Like the, the average punter who just watches the game, he's just watching the game for what it is or she's just watching the game for what it is. But sometimes players are having you know awful issues coming into a game and you don't know what they're like mentally or physically coming into it. So we had a, an A versus B sort of, or A and B training match uh, last Sunday. It was all mixed up, so a week out from the final. And um, I was kind of stepping out. I was thinking, you know what, I won't do much. The only thing I want to, for the final is to have my hips and my back right. So I was kind of stepping out of a lot of stuff. And then I, um, Keen O'Callaghan stepped out of the training match and uh, Willie just asked me if I wanted to step in and I was like, no. And then I said, you know what, I will. Because I didn't, you don't want to go into a final not having played either. Then you're like, am I sharp or whatever. So I went in, felt grand. Then uh, I was asked, did you want to come out? And I said, you know what, I'll stay in. So it's my own fault. And then I went for, to chase Mark Schutte for a ball. Of course, I'd have to be Mark and that greyhound. And my hamstring popped. I've never had a hamstring pop in my life. Now, you've had lots of them, so... I didn't really know how bad is this. I just assumed I was done. So I came off, labored off the pitch, went and got physio on the on the Monday, then I got more on the Wednesday. And like like a lot of people, I've had a lot of physio over the years on different injuries. I've never gone through agony like this. So it was like way down the hamstring, off to the right towards the tendon. I couldn't really give you the medical sort of prognosis on it. But uh, getting an elbow into that. And you know, like we've all gone through horrible physio, but I was just, you know sweat bucketing out of me biting my fist and eventually i had to say please stop like but then you're there trying to tell the manager look i might be able to play i might be able to play maybe start me see how i go on the thursday then i was told try some sprints so i was sort of running out to the 21 slow enough then build up the pace and and i was there i think i'm doing 100 percent, but i was probably doing about 90 percent, and you're just getting through it so i really didn't know if i could or couldn't play so this was all going on and then I was told I wasn't starting and you know how you'd be You're like you know this is no slight on the management right? but I'm there furious because you know you want to start see how long can I last because you also don't want the management to bring you on and then take you back off so 15 minutes into the game that I'm brought on and but like we were kind of a nice bit behind we were chasing the game at that stage but uh yeah it's just coming into a game not having a clue where you're at and I'm sure lots of viewers have been through that as well it's a tough place to be. You've been there too. Yeah, no, I think the point you made at the start is a very kind of pertinent mm. point. I was chatting to Nick Bohan, there's Dublin Ladies football manager there not too long ago, and he was just talking about like even, you know, uh, going into the, the inter county campaign now, uh, after when the club finishes up, and, you know, the levels of training maybe that they, that they would have done would be a good bit less maybe than other years, and maybe some people will be nursing injuries and things like that. Nobody cares. It's so rootless. Nobody cares. Once you're on that pitch, nobody cares whether you're out for six weeks, six days, or six months. Nobody cares whether you had a sleepless night the night before, up feeding a baby, or whatever it is. Nobody, nobody cares. And uh, it just, it, you, you kind of, that's why you can take some things on face value. You need to read into it. It's like a match report. You need to read in a little bit more to it. Oh, Bernie was taken off after 40 minutes. Um, oh, like, oh, he must have got claimed or whatever, which has happened several times. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe he was carrying it off. Or, do you know what I mean? I like, yeah. just think people need to read into it a bit more. But yeah, having an injury going into a big match is, um, yeah, it just plays in your mind. You literally cannot think of anything else. And like the thing is, when you're playing with an injury during a game, sometimes 
you know I'm running at 80% here and you're hoping that, let's say, as an older player, that your experience might get you through what had you. So, like, that's what it was. And running around thinking, this could go, this could go, this feels ropey. And you're like, should, should I sort of put the hand up and tell management, have someone ready because I think my hamstring is about to explode here. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's a mad way to be going through a game. And I, I think a lot of people probably don't realize that. Uh, not that I'm looking for sympathy, I'm just saying that this is the kind of the reality out there. It was a very funny one at one stage during the game. Not funny at all for me now. And people think this is sour grapes, and if you do think it's sour grapes, grand. But this is actually the reality of what happened. So <laughs> I, I bet sour grapes. Yeah. I, 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 I was in, and the referee, as Finbars were about to take a free in from midfield, would say, but the, the penalty area was crowded with players. And uh, the referee comes over to me and says, number three, um, you're on your last morning, or you've been spotted, something like that. And I looked at my man and I said, what's he talking about? Because I hadn't done anything. And he said, yeah, you haven't hit me yet. And uh, like, as he was saying that, St. Finbar's hit the, hit the free in. They obviously didn't know this conversation was going on, but the free came in. I was distracted by the referee. The guy who was marking Eamon Trollier Dillon was distracted by the referee. Trollier, we turn around then, the ball's coming in. Trollier gets the break and sticks it in the net. Is that sour grapes or is that me going, like, this referee wouldn't allow quick puck outs, but he allowed this to happen. It was Yeah, no, that's a mad one. Um, I've had a, I've had, I, had a, I had a similar instance, but it was actually a selector with an under-21 team many moons ago, and I didn't give a lad water, one of our lads, and was coming back around the goal, and the umpire, who was, I don't know, was he from the club that we were playing or what, he, said, he just said to me, I saw you. I said, once more, and I'm reporting it to the referee. And I was like, I was just in my head, I was like, warn me for what I don't know what it's on about but for the next 10 or 15 minutes that's all that was going through my head what is that clown talking about and it just like I don't know whether it was just to get me off my game or whatever but you'd often see club games college games even county games as well that there would be lads designated to do that stand in the opposition manager's eye line stand in his way be be, cha- be saying something that he that he can within earshot of him take him out of the game um, I know that's not this, exactly the same as happened to you but the referee that was a bit of a mad one I don't know whether he was meant to talk to the under the number three at the far end or he whether was, it was yeah. you or, yeah but it's, a mad, it's, a mad, it's a mad kind of one but it just shows you that you need to probably be prepared for all eventualities and not let anything get inside your head during a game. But these, it can be hard to not to when these things happen. Yeah, and to be fair, look, St. Finbars were the better team and they turned it around from the first group game. Absolutely deserved their win. They kept getting scores to keep us at bay throughout that second half. And they got the goals early and just found the pitch of it a lot quicker than we did. So congrats to them and they're back up to the Senior A Championship for next year. Move on to the Limerick final. So Napiershig... They completely destroyed Dune, 527 to 112. So that's the sixth title in the past decade for Napiershig, who are just, they look like they're back to their old selves this year under Kieran Birmingham. And you know the way they started that championship against Kilmallock? They did not look impressive at all. So the way they've turned it around has been very impressive. And Will O'Donoghue, who was the captain, he said afterwards, people were quick to throw it around and push it on our face. So I think a lot of the people got their answer tonight. In terms of like people saying they weren't the same team, but to be fair, they weren't quite the same team for a little period of time. But it was more from the outside, we're wondering, well, why aren't you? Because you see, you obviously have the quality, but now they are back. I mean, that was a savage performance. Yeah, it's funny because Shane Dowland actually questioned their hunger after the first game. So it was one of their own almost that said that the hunger wasn't there or whatever. Uh, I think 527 is the highest score ever put up in a, in a Limerick hurdle final. Absolutely outstanding. Um, and, and you know, I've always said this about Limerick and it's one of the most impressive things about Limerick is is when you look at particularly a lot of the Napiersha guys and you look at how little involvement they've had with the senior county team and you're thinking, like the David Dempsey, David Dempsey will be some player to be coming in with 20 minutes to go for Limerick. And the hand on him is as good a hand as is out there, and he's a lethal finisher. Connor Boylan, the same. Um, Ronan Lynch, as, as you mentioned just in our notes, he just said he was out with the sweeping brush, and he was. He was just sweeping up left, right, and centre. Um, and on the other side of things, like Pat Ryan had a day of days uh, in the semi final when they beat Kilmallock. But whatever it was, just nothing was going right from the other day. I was again. I was chatting to Pat Flory after the match, 
yesterday in Turles and he just said he yeah, felt sorry for for Pat Ryan. He said he said I'm 64 years old and I would have been, I would have done more than he did yesterday. He just said nothing. He tried so hard. He said he must have covered he must have covered 10 or 12 kilometers. He said and just whatever he tried, nothing was going right. And it was just kind of one of those days. And Dune were always going to struggle when you know he's their other big name really him and Barry Murphy and when they were relatively quiet with Richie English and Daryl Donovan already out they were always going to struggle but uh, geez, it was like it was a serious performance by Napierstein and you're kind of just thinking these lads like whatever about winning Limerick yeah they've got the Limerick honours back but you're thinking how exciting would it, would they be heading into a Munster campaign you know against Kiladangan against Bally Gunner with possibly Kula uh, you'd have Kula and maybe Bally Hale or Dixborough on the other side as well and Mount Leinster Rangers even in Carlow like you're just thinking the games that we're going to miss out on um, and, and something that I'd say as well like when you won your two All-Ireland titles and they were unbelievable wins but you didn't beat Bally Hale along the way and I know last year must have hurt the fact that you didn't get a crack at Bally Hale and I know that that'd be it's like when Portumna and Bally Hale met in the All-Ireland semi-final and then met in an All-Ireland final like that was a dream meet that was an inter-county meet and I know that's something that you would love and I'm sure it's something Bally Hale would love because I'm sure they were envious watching you um, winning your two All-Irelands and it's just an awful pity that we're going to kind of be robbed of that whether it's later this year or early next year yeah we definitely let down our part of the bargain last year because that you'd love to see that match and you know um i'd probably said this before but it, for the 2017 2018 final as soon as we won dublin for all the way up until the following march all we were hearing about was kula versus napierstein you know that's going to be a great final you know you hadn't gotten through leinster you hadn't gotten through your all-ireland semi-final but that's what you keep hearing but schlock miller or another team you'd love to see them back in the mix maybe don't lie but i i've probably said this to you as well before i would really like to see an open draw as soon as the county titles are done now fair enough the provincial championships they're still really important and unbelievable to win them we saw it at meant personally last year you know, even Mount Leinster, of course, several years ago. But, you know, I mean, the Connacht Championship doesn't exist. The Ulster Championship, there's only a couple of teams, really, that are going to win it. Wouldn't an open draw be unbelievable where you could get, like, unless Bally Hale win their championship and unless, like, Bally Gunner or whoever win Munster and maybe even get to an All-Ireland final, the chances of seeing those teams play against each other is just so, so minimal. But if it was an open draw, anything can happen any year. I just think that would be so exciting. Yeah, and I think you'd get um, at club level, it wouldn't happen at county level, but you'd get an even 16 teams at club level. Mm. You'd get 16 county champions, and you'd just have the last 16 quarter semis and final. It'd be absolutely unbelievable. And without being smart, like, what a time to suggest it as well. You could you could nearly play that. You could play that off over five weekends. Give, give a rest weekend maybe in the middle of it or something like that. Um, like, I'm open to anything to, just to make sure that provincial and all Ireland championships go ahead. I, I still it it still just doesn't seem likely. Like there was no great talk out of, out in the Pearson camp the other day. There's no one campaigning for it. There's no one really really pushing the boundaries apart from apart from maybe up in Schlock Neil. So I don't know whether I don't know whether it's going to happen. Just back to the Pearson again as well. Like the the goalkeeper had his second child. Uh, his his wife had a second child in the hours after the match as well. Um, imagine that. Imagine winning the county county final and then have been blessed been blessed to win a county final and then been blessed in another way altogether. It's absolutely unbelievable. Um, just from a doom point of view then as well, I think Josh Ryan was probably their, probably their main man just in the absence of maybe, you know, their two kind of superstars and in the absence of, of Pat Ryan and Barry Murphy playing well. He was really their, their kind of standout player. On the other side, Peter Casey, brilliant. Uh, as we said, David Dempsey on fire, Connor Boylan, very good. Will O'Donoghue, we've talked about this, like I think Will O'Donoghue can, could dominate a county hurling around the middle for the next four or five years. I just think he's so strong, so effective. He's a real, uh, he's probably not like the same type of hurler as Mick Fenley is, but he, he can have that same kind of physical impact that Fenley had. Like I remember when Kilkenny were under pressure in the 2015 All Ireland final, and Fenley just came out and kind of waylaid Joe Canning with a stroke about two minutes into the second half and just totally changed the tone of the game. And I just think Will O'Callaghan or Will uh, Will O'Callaghan Will O'Donoghue has the capability of doing that at county level. Yeah, I agree. He's so aggressive on the field. Uh, ju- just a point there about Dune. I would say, like Kilmallock, obviously have to be fairly disgusted that they couldn't get over a team that were beaten this badly, having previously beaten the Pearshig themselves. 
And they obviously didn't find a way to make Dune pay for not having Richie English and Darrow Donovan. You know, maybe Kilmallock will say, we didn't play a quarter final, maybe we'd been waiting in the wings for four or five weeks for a match, and maybe that affected them. Maybe so. But I think the Pearsick have so much quality all over the field that Dune had too many fires to put out. And if you didn't stop Peter Casey, which is tough to stop, then David Dempsey was going to make you pay, or then Conor Boylan was going to run up the middle, or then Adrian Breen was going to get a few scores. And pretty much all of them got on the score sheet, and they all, like so many of them, had eight, seven, eight, nine out of ten performances. There was just too much for them to do. And you mentioned Josh Ryan. Yeah, he was very good, took the game to them. But other than that, I mean, they just couldn't get into it. And I was trying to keep an eye and see who would manmark Pat Ryan. Because, he, you know, he's in around the centre forward and, you know, Ronan Lynch probably isn't going to be the man to man mark. He wanted to sit back and kind of dictate the game, get on the ball. And I kind of forgot to really pay attention to it because Pat wasn't really in the game. And, like, he's such a good player, but he wasn't really in the game. And at times, Jerome Boylan seemed to be following him. But I couldn't actually say for certain if he was man marking him or not. And please get your comments in if, if you have any thoughts on that. But once Pat Ryan couldn't get into it and once Barry, Barry Murphy wasn't in it, there was really nowhere for them to go because unfortunately there's just so much quality on that in the Pearshick side like how do you get past Mike Casey as well do you know for club full forwards it's one thing an inter-county forward trying to stop him and you know Conor Callahan had you know I mean it was probably one of the toughest days that top Conor Callahan had in that drawn all Ireland final so for a club full forward to go in on him you know it's going to be so hard so I think kind of doing they didn't give up in that first half when they went four or five points behind they came back made it close but ultimately, was it? It was just a case of the damn breaking, wasn't it? Yeah, you kind of just felt like they were going. They could get overran at, at any second. There was just too many of the Pearsley players playing well. And it's funny. There was a couple of comments left under our preview video last week where uh, one viewer and fair, fair enough, it's his opinion, but he, he just questioned whether how much how much was in some of the Pearsley forwards. And in fairness, I think they they answered him pretty defiantly the other day. Like five twenty seven is outrageous scoring, and even. Just like the scoring that's been put up now at club level is phenomenal. Like you, you're seeing like inter county scores being put up over sixty minutes at club level, and it just shows you how much higher the standard has reached in the last you know five to six years. Like when you look at your Kula team, you look at Bally Hale, you look at Bally Gunner, like the standard has gone through the roof at club level now, particularly amongst those elite clubs. Um, and long may it continue as long as that standard keeps rising the games just keep getting better and better and it's just a pity that we won't see any of these kind of dream matchups that we'd love to see if there was a club all Ireland to go ahead who would be your favourites mine would be at the moment given what I've seen at the weekend and people will disagree and please get the comments in I would go with Napiercik I know they were playing against a Dune team missing two of their best players and arguably their two best players like Richie English plays centre back normally when he's fit and he is very dominant for Dune Darrow Donovan can dictate the play from midfield. But I just think Napier should look like they're back. Uh, they do look like they're back. I think there'll be so many dream meetings there. Bally Hale haven't played Napier I think I'd be right in saying. Don't no, think they, they have any. No. Yeah. Uh, Bally Hale, they obviously beat Bally Gunner in the semi final a couple of years ago. That'd be another really, really interesting meeting. Uh, Kiladangan playing any of those teams. I know they're only a new side on the block, but playing the likes of Bally Gunner in a, in a Munster Championship would be very, very interesting. God, as it's well. mouthwatering. It actually is mouthwatering. No, it is, yeah. Um, and we haven't we haven't mentioned Stock Neil. I think still think Stock Neil will be a small bit below probably Bally Hale, Bally Gunner and, and the Pearshig. I'd I'd still have I'd probably still have Bally Hale at Bally Hale as favourites, to be honest with you, even though it'd be so interesting to see uh, a team go for three in a row and a team um, probably hurt over a couple of disappointments in recent years and the hunger that, that, that brings with that. But to be yeah, just Unfortunately, we're going to miss out in a couple of couple of big games. And I just just I said, Bally Hale were favourites too, or I would have them as favourites. Um, I still think they're going to get they're going to get it hard against Dixborough on Sunday, but that's for another day. Yeah, I think Bally Hale will come through that. I mean, Dixborough won a county title a couple of years ago, and they're obviously a very good team. But I think you'd have more question marks over them because they got eliminated from the Kilkenny Championship last year at the quarter final stage after scoring one six against Darren Zone. So that's always going to give question marks. But look, if they answer him against Bally Hale. That would be the proof in the pudding that this team is unbelievably serious and, and of a really high quality. So I'm actually looking just forward to it. That, just on that chain, while we're chatting about Kilkenny, just a quick quick couple of notes. The, the intermediate and junior uh, semi-finals were on over the weekend. So Owen Murphy's Glenn Moore actually went down to Listowney. Listowney surprised them. 
it's Downey who wouldn't have any any county representation, definitely not at senior level anyway. Um, and Glen Moore would have obviously Alan Murphy, King Owen Murphy was centre back. Jerry Elwood hit, hit seven points from play and, and they were still beaten. So it's List Downey against Thomas Town. Thomas Town won the other semi final. Uh, they were obviously beaten in the final last year by, T- by Tullerone. And Conaghy Shamrocks, the reigning All Ireland junior. Uh, champions are back in the junior final. They're playing the Dixborough, Dixborough second team. But no more than last year when they were beaten by all Lofton second team, this is anything but a formality. Dixborough were very, very impressive over the weekend. And uh, Conaghy will need, uh, I think it's James Bergen, is their kind of their star yeah, forward. Yeah. Plays, plays, plays given with DCU last year. But how sick would it be if they were beaten in the final again by a, a reserve team of one of the senior clubs? And while you're like, reigning junior All Ireland champions. But that that'll be interesting. I think the list downy Thomas Down game is this weekend, not hundred percent sure about the junior final. Yeah. So the Kerry final was on over the weekend also. Kilmiley two twelve, champions caused by one fourteen. So they're now dethroned. So great achievement for John Myler, the former Kerry manager, former Carlo and Wexford also. Because he'd been involved with St Martins, they had disappointment getting knocked out early enough in the knockout stages in Wexford. And he comes back, gets involved with Kilmiley. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but a great kicked goal from Matthew o- uh, O'Connor for Kilmiley. I think he'd done the same against Abby Dorney earlier in the competition. But uh, Kilmiley back on top. Unbelievable, I'd say. I, 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 you'd never wish bad on anybody, but I'd say the Kilmiley boys were half delighted when Martins were knocked out. Because without being smart, that seems like a lifetime ago. So they would have had John Myler John Miley to themselves for... He's probably the goods of about 10 weeks, I'd say. Probably about 8 to 10 weeks nearly. And um, in fairness, they were totally on top. I think they were two ten to 4 points up at half time, And they didn't score in the third quarter. And I think it was back level. What was it? It was 1-11 to 2-8 uh, midway through, just after the, the water break in the second half. The introduction of, I think it was Brandon Barrett. I don't think he played all year due to injury. And uh, as the report said, Mark Murphy's report said, Big Sean Lahey. Uh, you know, you know, you know when it's mentioned when you're described as Big Sean Lahey that he's probably a fairly larger than life player and character. But uh, that's how the Rain and Champions get back into it. But in fairness to to Kilmiley, and it's so difficult because it can happen when you have an early lead and you're 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 caught by you're maybe just caught that you can kind of fade away and all your momentum from earlier on in the game can kind of dissipate. But in fairness, they were able to kick back on again and a massive win for them. Yeah, congrats to them. The Galway semi-final, only one out of the two was on over the weekend because the uh, Capitagal versus St. Thomas's game, that was postponed until next weekend because of a positive COVID-19 case there. The semi-final that did go ahead saw Turlock Moore beat Lockray 217 to 117. Now, Turlock Moore, as we keep saying, they're the common team in Galway. They're the joint fourth most successful club in the county in, in history in Galway. But it's their first final in 30 years, and I, I believe they haven't won it since 1986. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long time away from the top table, consider like, how many titles they have. And when you go down through probably their team now, it's a seriously, seriously star-studded team. Just a, a quick couple of names. We obviously know, know Dahi Burke very well, but then like uh, Gary Burke, Sean Loftus, Sean Lalanne, Jamie Holland, Kevin, H- Kevin Hussey, Fergal Moore and Dahi Burke midfield as well. Ronan Burke, who was a Galway panellist for years, full back too. Like it's a seriously, seriously strong squad. But I, I, I thought I, I was thinking this would be ropey enough because Lockray had had been going so well. But in fairness to them, they got scores at crucial times. Um, I, I know you saw it as well, but the the, the catch and the flick from Dahi Burke just but just before half time was absolutely outrageous, and it just kind of got me thinking like. From full back to centre back to wing back to midfield to centre forward to being full forward catching that ball to winning you know multiple All Ireland club football titles with Cara Finn like there's very little the man cannot do like he, he's a man for every season and a man for every code but the looks of things as well yeah and do you remember when he got interviewed after the All Ireland final I don't know was it 2019 maybe but he was being interviewed and there was like one of those glass kind of advertising backgrounds there and the full panel was in behind it you know just kind of cheering along as he was getting interviewed he seems like he's a um, very popular member of the panel as well so but it's like this, I thought that day I couldn't believe it that day I said they gave Dahi Burke the man of the match award and I was like alright boys good luck trying to get him to do an interview because he's never 
He's never, ever been on record doing an interview for anything that I've ever come across at all. And they, they managed, they managed to get me. Obviously, couldn't refuse, or they got him at a, an opportune moment or whatever. But so, some player, in fairness, and like the fact that like he's not been outstanding or anything for them either. He, he's kind of he's kind of trucking away, but they've got an awful lot of other lads that are really, really contributing, really, really heavily, and um, they're they're going to be hard beaten. I'd imagine it would be Thomas's in the final. Um, I, I, I kind of fancy Thomas's to to beat Capitagal, but that would not be. An unbelievable match, maybe David Burke versus Dahi Burke midfield in a, in his Galway County final. The emerging side against the kind of not the old force, but the side that have been there and have done it and have obviously won a club all Ireland as well. Be seriously, seriously interesting. Just from a, a lot great point of view, again another battle of performance. Um, looks like looks like they're going to be around for a, a long time. Lots, of, loads of young players kind of allied with you know the likes of Paul Hoban and Johnny Coleman fullback who seems to. Have, Kind of sorted out that problem position for them, but they look like they're a side that are here to stay. And um, yeah, it was interesting because the two backroom teams were fairly star So Jeff Linsky was involved with with Loch Ray, you had Franny Ford involved on the other side. I think Barry Cullinan as well, who was involved when James Horn was there too, and Cyril Donlan is involved with Turlock as well. So like these are when you're getting towards the latter stages of these championships, usually you're seeing a lot of the same faces that you would see at county level and as we said before earlier in the summer the fact that county is on the kind of back burners at the moment it does give a lot of lads a chance to go back you know franny fords and uh, sarah donnan who was playing for pierces this year gives them a chance probably to get involved with with clubs and do things maybe that they wouldn't have been able to do normally during the county season yeah without doubt so uh capital will have plenty to say yet but uh that does sound like a bit of a dream final if it does turn out to be turlock more against st thomas's Quick word then on Cavan Mullahorn. They beat Coothill Celtic by just a point, 2 9 to 1 11. And then the down final. It sounds like it was unbelievable drama. Actually, I'll just touch on Westmead first. So the semi finals there Castletown Gagan, they beat Castle Pollard 4 16 to 3 10. And Clon Kilsoff, Loch Lane Gales by 16 points to 12. The down final. So Ballycran 2 18, Porta Ferry 2 18. After extra time, didn't go to penalties. That'll go to a replay. If anyone knows why penalties weren't uh, wasn't the um, the way to sort this out, let us know. But uh, I couldn't find it online before we started to record. But Ballycran, they were going for three in a row, whereas Portaferry were looking to end the six-year wait. Battle of the two sides on the peninsula there. But I was reading an article from Brendan Crossan in the Irish News, and he some I mean his article it was just spilling out of him the the sort of occasion that it was and the passion and all that. So I'm just going to read out. Um, a little segment of his piece and he goes Portaferry boss and force of nature Gary Smith lived every second of Saturday's final like it was last ever hurley match here was a man rampaging up and down the sidelines and yet he just buried his father a couple of days earlier Paddy Smith who had Alzheimer's disease suffered a stroke last Friday and passed away a few days later it's been an emotional week the Portaferry manager said you just put it to the back of your mind I never thought about the hurley much but that's what we live for. You had extra time, 218 to 218. We are two evenly matched teams. There's never anything between us. I mean, it's, it's about like we talked about the performance. People don't know what's going on in your head in the week leading up to a game. Obviously, like Gary Smith had, you know, a terrible week leading into this. And still, like this game just ends up consuming him, which is totally natural too. And probably delighted to have something to distract him too and take up his, uh, his headspace. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's why, like, nobody knows. Like, nobody knows if he'd been a bit off color or not himself. Not a lot of people wouldn't have just wouldn't have understood. And the record books go and show. Like, if you play a bad game or the manager you lose the game, it doesn't show what was going on in your life or what was going on in that week. But uh, I'm sure that would have given him some lift and to see his lads do what they did yesterday. And even just, I I think sometimes the GA is a, is a great leveler in the sense it, it shows people um, it shows kind of just what the club and the parish and what people around the people that they know it shows what it means to them and how much it is and it's a great it's a great kind of outpouring of emotion like you have people you know people crying after winning the hurling match or losing the match that wouldn't cry in, a, in everyday life mm. but it's just people just get caught up in it that's why that's why we love it so much and uh, I thought it was really interesting interest as well that uh, Kira McGeehan, obviously, the, the athlete that we know, who's absolutely flying it there. She was on co-commentary for Park TV. So, fresh from breaking the, the Irish 1000 uh, meet record in Monaco earlier this month. She's obviously a former Porter Ferry Camogie player. But it just shows you as well, like, 
you can take you know you can take the man or the woman out of wherever but you can't take you know port of ferry or wherever out of them and it just shows you obviously how much her club means to her i know she's always been she's always been good for getting her getting her club colors and her county colors out any time they've been playing but just i just thought that was an interesting one because like, she's a uh, she's like you know she's making her set making a charge on the the european scale and even on the world scale in in, uh, in athletics at the moment but uh interesting final i'd love to know why you didn't go to penalties i'd love to know what the what the reason was there but in that sort of a scenario particularly with gary smith scenario it's it's probably nice to have another another day out yeah and you're talking about the the passion and how it kind of overwhelms people you you would you were at in Thurles and you saw the reaction of the Kildangan people and no doubt they were going nuts and there was tears and the whole lot as you'd expect, but I don't know if you saw afterwards on TV they were showing Noel McGrath's reaction. He'd had a great game, obviously seconds beforehand he thought they'd done it, they'd won it, and then he's just overwhelmed with with kind of just, I mean he was heartbroken, and they showed him throwing his hurley on the ground and then he actually just collapsed on the ground and he was just kind of convulsing like he was just. In bits over. I don't know if you could see it from where you were. No, I did. No, no. I um, I he was one of the first people I saw. I literally looked at the Kildangan lads on the left, and then I saw him because he was actually in around, he's in around the sixty-five, um, going towards the town, and I saw him, and he was like even fifteen minutes after, and as the presentations were going on, he, he was literally inconsolable. I'd say he was he was unable to talk, and it just like there's a lad. There's a lad who's you know been unbelievable on the national stage and overcome so much even even personally with sickness and things like that and that you just see how much it means to him no more than it means to all the rest of his club mates but that's that's what what it's all about and that's why we kind of get lost in the club championship as well it's actually interesting chatting to frankie mcgrath after because i kind of chat him after and i was like like how are you gonna like lift these lads up for the football final next week and uh, he, he was adamant that if any group could do it, that that group could do it. And he pointed back, he's, uh, he's hoping kind of uh, history repeats itself. I think they were beating a point by Kappa White in the 1987 county final. And they went out and beat commercials a couple of weeks after in the football. So uh, that's, he's hoping history repeats itself anyway. But yeah, that's the, the ups and downs of, of, of club hurling of football. But geez, it was a, an amazing week. Like that, 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 uh, that final tip will live long, long in the memory. Yeah, and like just as I was coming back after playing our match, I didn't know the score in the tip one. I just got a te- an incoherent text from my father that had the word goal in there in the middle of it. And I was like, I have no idea what he's talking about. So I went straight to Twitter and... Uh, I, and I just saw the goal from Brian Malachny and I was like, what an amazing way to do it. And actually, when I rang the father then, he says to me, and you know what, back in 1988, Pat McGrath, who's you know, the father of, the, of Noel and John, he scored a last second goal against Burris Elite to steal the title for Lockmore. So they've obviously uh, had that last second drama to their favour in the past. That's about the height of it then, is it? We've been nearly all yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, geez, we could probably talk a bit more if we wanted to yeah, about that tip time and a few other things this weekend, but uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, brought to you by OrgoRetro.com. If you want to get these jerseys or any other of their classic range, go to OrgoRetro.com, use the promo code OurGame, and you'll get 15% off. Thanks very much, Michael. Cheers, Shane. Good man.